world's largest democracy goes to the polls from the 19th of April to the 1st of June to elect the Indian Parliament. The election will be held in several stages and it sees the incumbent Narendra Modi looking to secure a third term in office. The BJP has now been in power for a decade and is looking to cement its legacy and leave a mark on India. Whoever wins the elections faces some major challenges from the economy to energy and to communal relations. Here to discuss this is our South Asia analyst, Shabi Ul Hassan. Salam, Shabi, uh, how are you doing? Welcome, Salam Adnan. I'm doing good. How are you doing? It's Alhamdulillah, bye -bye. Alhamdulillah. It's uh, good to be here. So, quite an important time in uh, South Asia. You've got this major election going on. Obviously, there's quite a lot to this. So, I think let's get straight into it, Shabi. Where would you say India is today after two terms of BJP rule? Yeah, thanks, Adnan, for the question. And, and that's a good point to start the conversation today. Now, depending on who you ask, Adnan, you will get a mixed bag of assessment about how India is doing. Uh, but they would all agree to one thing, that Modi's era, the last two terms, has been a period of dramatic changes in the country. Okay. To summarize India's current state of affairs, let's quickly look at some of the key indicators on economy, the society, and the politics itself. So on the economy, this is quite often mentioned. India is now counted amongst top five fastest growing economies with a booming stock market and surging corporate profits. But this, I, mean, I would add that this corporate profits are going to a limited number of players, local, loyal, and close to the regime. Having said that, this growth is marked by jobless, uh, they, they, they call it a jobless growth, marked with high inflation and very historic high unemployment rates. Uh, it's very difficult to get actual numbers because the government has stopped publishing unemployment figures, but it can, it is varies from 15% to somewhere around close to 40% uh, in the worst case, right, which is the standard number. On One success story has been the government spending on roads, railways and infrastructure. This has, has surged under Modi and this has been a primary engine of economic growth in the last term that Modi had been in power. So yeah, if you go to India, you will you will see visible improvements in the infrastructure like roads and the railway network and a lot of construction around this like ports, airports. Um, well, to, be, to be honest, the government's economic policy is basically feeding up of neoliberal economic reforms that were started by the Congress, uh, which means increasing privatization of public services, healthcare, education, uh, roads, in ports, etc., etc., which, which always happens that the primary beneficiaries of this happen with the primary classes, and they are the ones most most happy. The government as is clear from the polls. As I said, this neoliberal economic reform was started by the Congress government earlier. So I mean, Modi could just claim to continue with this policy, the same policy, but yeah. on steroids. I would okay, like. so Shabhi uh, likes to present himself as a modernizer of India with his huge infrastructure projects. Looking at that and the economic record. How did the people of India see his record? Yeah, this is a million dollar question everyone has been trying to figure out. And there's a lot of commentary on this phenomena in the mainstream press, uh, both local and international. According to 2023 Pew Research, uh, about 8 in 10 Indian adults have a favorable view of the Prime Minister, which is uh, quite a high number. And all polling suggests that Modi is going to easily win a third term to office and maybe improving its tally in the parliament. As far as the results of the elections are concerned, they are not really in doubt. I mean, everyone has been predicting comfortable to win for, for Modi. But is it necessarily because of the economic records? Uh, that's uh, the question that everyone uh, challenges. Modi and BJP are expected to return to power. The Modi's modernizer image is more a result of a smart image management and propaganda than anything to do with the reality of his tenure as far as his economic performance is concerned. I briefly touched upon the economic records earlier. Enough now, let's take a closer look. Apart from the success story on the infra part and India's rising stature among the international investors. But the overall, the growth story is uh, a grim, I would suggest. Remember, the first term was marked by a demonetization disaster, a very uh, chaotic GST rollout, and of course, aggravating with the COVID crisis. Uh, Modi actually himself failed in meeting his own target of creating a $5 trillion economy. The second term has been marked with a bit of a growth. The government has come back to the growth cycle again, but it's still lagging uh, economies like China and even Bangladesh. Uh, as I said, the a major part, major feature of the economy has been jobless growth uh, with the uh, unemployment to historic highs. Inflation has been high. Modi's pet making India initiative, which was supposed to turn into our global manufacturing powerhouse, 
by cutting red tape, basically has been a flop. Healthcare spending is dismal. India is ranked 111th about out of 125 countries on the Global Hunger Index. Imagine this is like very close to sub-Saharan countries like Sudan and 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 Somalia, for example. The COVID pandemic saw the largest number of deaths, close to more than a million, and then Modi faced a lot of defeats on a lot of his pro-market reforms, especially focusing on the farming sector. But he had to roll back. So yeah, uh, I mean, for the Modi economic performance is concerned, there's nothing to boast about. As I said, this is mostly uh, smart uh, media management and image management. But I would say the economic, uh, decimal economic record would still lead him to a comfortable victory in the elections, as we'll discuss later on the, the reasons behind this. Uh, Why is that? Popularity? Yeah, popularity. The polls show Modi is far ahead in the polls. If he wins this election, which he looks like he will, it will equal Nehru's record of winning three elections. Is it correct to say he's very popular? That's why he's going to win or are there other factors here? Yes, he is popular. According to the 2023 Pew Research, eight out of 10 Indian adults have a very favorably favorable view of the Prime Minister. So, and this is reflected when you when you actually look at the reality on the ground. So the reason behind his popularity, uh, Adnan, I would add, has more to do with his social agenda, which is uh, marked with uh, with aggressive Hindutva propagation and but Modi's rise Adnan should be analyzed in the context of the uh, the global crisis post 2008 economic crisis where liberal democracies we saw a marked rise of high uh, right wing governments and movements and the rise of authoritarian leaders like Trump uh, Bolsonaro an example Modi basically comes in that uh, trajectory of global politics as you know, we all know, the, the era has seen a rise in public dissatisfaction with the institutions. So people are now pinning their hopes in authoritarian politicians who position themselves as outsiders from the traditional ruling elite circles. And Modi's image management team focuses on his humble tea seller background, who rose to the top due to hard work and incorruptible nature, which is quite an asset in, in a country like India. And, and he has managed to keep his image intact as a non-corrupt politician in a largely corrupt polity, which India is known for. And I would add, Modi is a populist leader par excellence. Uh, he has expertly tapped into the general public anger and disenchantment with the country's dismal state of affairs under Congress' 50 years rule, marred with corruption, nepotism, and increasing Hindu-Muslim divide, which was, a, I would add, a direct legacy of the Britain's uh, divide and rule policy during their colonial rule of India. One thing I would add is Modi's government scheme of providing free food grains to more than 813 million people, or basically half of the population, have contributed to his popularity amongst the masses. But the key factor behind this, behind his popularity is at an ideological level where, the, where the Indian society has shifted towards the right. So hence, secular ideals no longer appeal to them, right? Modi has basically redefined the political discourse and its boundaries from now what the mainstream used to be secular and socialist, uh, socialist ideals, now it is Hindu right-wing ideals. A majority of Hindus actually see Modi as a guardian of their faith. They love him for being unapologetically a Hindu compared to Congress leaders who traditionally downplayed their Hindu identities. He, and he has delivered the key demands of the Hindu right-wing. For example, he has overseen the construction of the temple, Ram Temple, abolished Article 370, he has looked uh, the other way when his party functionaries have fanned fires of Muslim hatred leading to lynching, and which has ironically endeared him more to his Hindu base. He has passed laws to prevent Hindus from converting and to leave the faith. So yeah, his his aggressive policy propagating the Hindu agenda, and it's unfortunate, but a lot of his base see him as being harsh on Muslims, which actually leads to his increase in popularity. So yeah, there are many reasons for his continuing popularity but which has less to do with his economic performance and more to do with, do with the side reasons I have said. So, communal divisions definitely, Shabi, have been a key feature of Modi's time in power. Why did he resort to this? And considering the fact that you're saying he, he is popular despite this, and what role do you think communal divisions will play after the electoral result? Yeah, that's a question that uh, needs maybe a, another topic for our podcast in the future. But just to give you a, a summarized view of what I feel is happening. To understand more this action, you have to understand the Hindu nationalist agenda of his party and the organization that it originates from, which is the RSS. And uh, these were clearly espoused by the founding ideologues like Savarkar and and goal worker, uh, who were basically inspired by ideas of European nationalism and how to fashion a modern nation state for Hindus only which had never been the case in, in, in history. Um, for example, Savar argued that India should be, belong to newly defined the Hindu identity, 
which considered the, the land as the fatherland and the motherland, and basically a holy land, and which basically includes Muslims and Christians who by default uh, cannot belong to this nation. Now, BJP is not like most parties, a political front for the RSS. It's a grassroots organization defining in the Dua ideology and its aims. Its, its goal is not just to win elections, Adnan, and pass discrete policies, which what people would believe a political party does, actually. BJP sees itself a political power to a much grander end, actually. A good way to understand its aim is to convert India into a Hindu equivalent of a Zionist state of Israel. They actually consider that as a role model to, if you look at their top party ideology these days. The so BTP is a Hindu nationalist organization that aims to completely restructure the Indian state as a Hindu nation. And that's their long-term agenda. How do they do it? That depends on who the who the party leadership is currently in, in place. But what is clear is it wants to put Hinduism at the center of public life and make full Indian citizenship contingent to being Hindu. So, so it has basically set in motion laws that threaten many of the country's Muslims with detention and eviction. Uh, we all remember the CANRC laws, which were basically aimed at this. To make these bigger changes, the Modi government or the BJP government must do more than just win a third term. It has to win big actually now to make these fundamental changes which they have always wanted to impose upon the country. And so, yeah, that's why they are looking uh, to a, a larger goal of winning the parliamentary majority with. And uh, a lot of people would think, uh, why would Modi do this or, or play this communal agenda? Uh, but it is in line with the political ideology and the, and the overall direction of the party which towards which it wants to take the country. So, Shabin, you mentioned the CA, the Citizen Amendment Act, um, just over a month ago, on the 11th of March, the government issued the rules for implementing this act. What is this and what role will it play in the elections and post-elections? Yeah, so for the listeners who, just to recap, the Citizen Amendment Act, also known as the CEA, was brought about by the Modi government in its first term. I remember it was around 2017, uh, if I'm not mistaken. What basically this law does, it essentially expedites Indian citizenship applications of Hindus, Parsis, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, and Christians who escaped to India from religious persecution from Muslim-majority countries like Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. Notice this list is missing Muslims, and this is done deliberately. So the Muslims have been excluded from this law that if, if, if the Muslim from other country claims persecution and wants to migrate to India, Basically, that they are barred. Now, they have deliberately omitted Muslims on various weak pretexts. And critics fear this is done to weaponize the law against Muslims to, in future, use this disenfranchise the actual Muslim citizens of the country and to render them stateless or, at best, second class citizens at the mercy of the increasingly Hindu Mediterranean state. Uh, I recall Amnesty International and all other major human rights organizations across the world, they had condemned this act. Amnesty called it like and called it as an amendment, as an act a blow to Indian constitutional values and international standards. So in January 2019, they actually announced the, the nationwide NRC, which is basically the National Register of Citizens, a, a government created list of all Indian citizens. Together, this is intended to create a system that can be actually further used to weaponize and harass Muslims. But... Uh, Due to many factors, once the law was passed, it was not actually put into practice. Uh, COVID played a big part in that, but I would say, and some critics would argue that it was mostly done for political reasons rather than for actual impl implementation, even though the, the, the long-term agenda was the party of, was always to implement a, such, such kind of a law. And notice, after the delay in implementation during this long two, two tenure, the, the law finally was operationalized just a few months ago, uh, before the elections were announced on 11th of March 2024. Now, so clearly, this is motivated by drawing political mileage out of it just before the elections. Yeah, so how are this more voter polarization by BJP before elections is unsurprising because we BJP has been expert at playing this uh, polarization game uh, to win elections. So what happens in future, it's not clear. Maybe it's a, a political stunt just before the elections. Maybe they are serious about it. We'll know, mm. we'll know in future. So Shabi, what on earth has happened to the opposition? What on earth happened to Congress? They, they don't seem to be able to stop the Narendra Modi train as it tramples through the whole of India. Um, what has happened to the opposition? What are they doing to uh, try and stop the BJP? Yeah, Adnan, uh, there are many factors uh, which are uh, contributing to total dominance of the BJP uh, in the political landscape of the country. I mean, uh, the first thing that the Modi government did was taking control of the mainstream media. 
And I would add most of the mainstream media is now controlled by corporates and businessmen who are very close to Modi himself, like Adani and Ambani. I recall uh, Adani actually overtook one of the channels which used to be uh, a very, even a mild critic of the government, like NDTV. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the first thing that they did uh, was basically taking control of the mainstream media. The media has helped actually amplify and boost Modi's image while hardly accounting him on his economic records and mismanagement. They have basically prevented details about the government's misuse of power from reaching ordinary voters. And uh, uh, when it, even if when it does it, right, the information is typically couched in a discourse about how the opposition has done and will do far worse things. So basically blaming the opposition, not the government. Now, that's uh, that's about the, about the media. Now, now, the Indian opposition itself has struggled to capitalize on any of the BJP's vulnerabilities. And there are many, actually. This is largely a, largely a failure of, um, I would say, the opposition, especially the, the main um, the opposition party, like the Congress. Uh, so Congress, which is the de facto leader of the Indian National Congress, is number Rahul Gandhi a scion of the Gandhi, Gandhi family. He was actually uh, charged and convicted for defaming Modi and he just narrowly escaped going to prison. And But he is widely considered an ineffective, uh, ineffective leader. And there are no second-run leadership in the Congress who can articulate a vision to compete what Modi offers to his base. And I would add to this commentary, Adnan, that Congress represents an idea which has lived its time. Right? Uh, it is on its way out and liberal secular ide- liberal secular and socialist ideals no one no one looks up to it because they have seen it fail uh, and a congress has not moved beyond these ideas they basically try to regurgitate the same ideas maybe trying to put uh, uh, some soft hindutva in the sense layering over it but why would people go for soft hindutva when they can get the real one so in in bjp and modi so yeah in effect bjp's biggest opposition party is held by a leader who does not want to lead and 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 party is basically rendered ruthless they have lost lost the organization and they cannot compete with the superior organizational structure of, of the bjp which is has a lot of money, is now backed with major corporate houses. As we all know, money plays a big role in Indian politics and most of the money and, and donations are going to the BJP and rather than to the opposition. So that's some of the idea, some of the key points which are leading to very ineffective opposition and and basically helping BJP continue its role. Uh, into the next so, Shabi, on the foreign policy front, how has uh, Modi performed? Yeah, traditionally, uh, Adnan, I would say India has always aimed at maintaining strategic and military ties with most of the world powers and alliances have been further cemented in Modi's era, uh, including with both uh, US and Russia. Recall the country's first Prime Minister, Dwalan Nehru, who also sought a leading role for India uh, and worked very hard from 1940s to 60s to promote a very distinct brand of foreign policy, which uh, was basically non-alignment with both the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, and basically engaging with the world through the international institutions like the, the United Nations. Unofficially, India was always considered in the socialist camp under the Soviet Union, but officially they were always non-aligned. Now, many West experts of foreign policy now see India's policy becoming more muscular under Mr. Modi uh, with a focus on aggressivity projecting India's soft power, basically to signal to the world that it has arrived on the global stage and it wants to share space with great powers and to have a greater say in and global affairs. Modi has taken uh, very forceful steps to further this India's image on the global stage. For example, he has been aggressively promoting the International Day of Yoga. Uh, he has refused to take sides in the war in Ukraine. He has used diplomacy against Pakistan. And he, uh, basically, they have been very proactive uh, in the climate agenda. I mean, you recall uh, last year, the government actually undertook an assassination of a Sikh Canadian national, officially designated a terrorist by the Indian government. Which is quite, I would say, unheard of before BJP government, especially under the Congress, where they used to do these things using diplomatic channels and not just go about killing people on foreign soils. Especially if you look at the West Asian countries, Modi has aggressively been pursuing bilateral trade relations with countries like Saudi Arabia and UAE, and they have basically signed uh, close to $100 billion trade deals investing in the country in the next five years. So yeah, Modi has successfully used a more confident and assertive, assertive society and especially the, the Indian, Indian diaspora to bolster his political, not only his party's political virtues, but to also improve India's global standing. As far as challenges are concerned, I mean, it's always the case that very nationalist foreign policy does not always serve the national interest. 
for example there always going to be conflict pursuing the very purely national foreign nationalist foreign policy for example let's consider its relationship with the washington now us has always seen india as as part of its axis to to contain china in the region and it wants to use india basically in this or to meet its foreign policy objective of China containment. Indian Indian elites understand this and I think they're leveraging this US urge to, to partner with India to contain China. But uh, they're not playing ball completely with with the US government expectations. So for example, the US government was pretty upset when Modi actually continued to trade with Putin despite the, the sanctions on the, on the country to the Ukraine war. So, I mean, great powers, including the states, are routinely, routinely resort to such tactics, but they are also well positioned to manage the consequences. As a rising power, India is still far from that level of global African influence. So, India's political leadership will therefore have to work carefully to ensure that its national diplomacy does not undermine national objectives and carefully balancing the demands of its more powerful partners like the US. And so, final question, Shabi. Obviously, we'll know the electoral result by the 1st, 2nd of June. Looking forward, what do you see as India's main strategic challenges? Adnan, India faces a host of challenges in the near future, which might pose serious obstacles to meeting its aspirations of becoming a global power. To list the most serious ones, the neoliberal economic policies are clearly not producing enough jobs to absorb a workforce of 8 to 10 million people entering the job market each year. The increasing unemployment will pose a significant challenge to the state, which might struggle to manage the rising dissatisfaction and potential societal unrest as well. Now, coming to wealth inequality, India has the worst wealth inequality in the world, where rich and the poor live in different Indias, I would say. The bottom half of India's population survives on 6% of the national wealth. The state would need to do a better job in ensuring that the fruits of growth are having an equitable impact across the different sections of the society, which clearly has not been happening so far. The Indian society has deep social inequalities due to the intense caste system, which is not seen improving even after 75 years of independence. Even though affirmative policies like reservation for the lower castes enshrined in the constitution have actually failed to positively impact the overall status of the backward and the downtrodden negatively impacted by the caste system. The country's health system is struggling, I would say, and it was actually badly exposed during the COVID the pandemic, where it could not cope with the surging infections, leading to the highest death count during the COVID pandemic amongst all the countries in the world. It was more than a million, some reports uh, indicated. To make things worse, India has one of the lowest spending in public health amongst all developing nations. The increasing privatization of public services are leading to a situation where important services like healthcare, education have started to go out of reach of ordinary citizens. And finally, the increasing social tensions in the country, especially deteriorating Hindu Muslim relations, will pose significant obstacles to manage social cohesions in the near future. Thank you for your time today, uh, Shabi. If you wish to learn more about the issues raised today, please check out our website, www.zeopolity.com. You can also learn more on other issues by accessing our website, where you'll find comprehensive insights, analysis, articles, and deep dives. I'm Adnan. Thank you for listening.